right, so I want to set the context, and the context of the Great War or World War I uh, is a context of European imperialism, which had been going on for 400 years, coming to uh, basically Europe dominating the entire globe in many ways at the end of the 19th century going into the 20th century. Uh, the alliance system set up in Europe, which I'll touch on on the next slide. Uh, globalization, which is something that we still talk about going on today. So these uh, political and economic systems that weave all of the different nations together. Um, and then modern technology and industrial technology that allow for this globalization and interact with it and interact with a war to bring it to such a scale as we see in World War I. And I wanted to give these two photos, and I know the top one's a little bit difficult to see, but the top one is Des Plaines around 1910, uh, dirt street, plank sidewalk, um, and there's a bunch of men with their horses standing in front of that. So that's one version of the context of World War I. Another context is down here. This is 1914. This is Maine Township High School, back when it was on Thacker Street, um, what's now the park, Central Park now. This is their building, spokestack for their coal-fired boiler system. There are electrical lines running into the school and a row of automobiles. So that's also the context of World War I. So it's at this border of some things that we think are very old fashioned and things that we think of as modern or nearly contemporary, at least recognizable to us. So when we talk about World War I, we talk about what are the causes and what is the trigger, okay? Because the causes is a very wide topic and very complex simultaneously, but there's just the one event that set everything in motion. So the causes, we see this polarization of Europe. I mentioned um, the alliance systems and European uh, imperialism. And so what you get is this really, do you remember doing Venn diagrams in school? Yeah. You get this really complex system of Venn diagrams where you have the green, countries up there, Italy, the Austria, Austria, Hungary, uh, and the German Empire who are in an alliance. And then you have Russia, France, and Britain in an alliance to counter that alliance. And then you have some countries that are kind of allied here and there, but right in the middle, that orange circle is what touches it off. And that is Bulgaria, Serbia, this Balkan region in Eastern Europe that kind of sits between um, Russia and Germany and Austria in that area. And you have these powers vying for influence and you find these local groups in Bulgaria and Serbia trying to ally themselves with these great imperial powers that have enormous wealth and enormous militaries that can help them you know, give themselves some sort of identity and independence from each other. And then what happens is, I'm sure we're all familiar with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian imperial throne. Um, and that was committed by a Serbian separatist. So a guy in the uh, orange circle shot the future leader of a guy in the green circles. And so what happened was that set off a chain reaction because if you have mutual defense pacts with each other, you have to come to the aid of your ally, otherwise you can't expect anything in return and your reputation on the international stage is tarnished. And so you get Germany saying, we'll do anything that you want, Austria-Hungary. Um, and so when Austria-Hungary entered a war against the Serbians, Germany backed them. And then Russia allied with Serbia. And then Russia's allies, 
and Germany's allies. And we see this entire thing setting off a chain reaction. And that's why the war built up so large. And I know I glossed over some details, <laughs> but it's way too complex. People spend their entire careers on that. So that starts um, July or June 28, 1914. And by the end of 1914, the entire Europe is involved in this war. And because of globalization, because of greater uh, political forces, you start getting the entire world involved, which is why people started calling it the World War or the Great War, great meaning large, not great meaning fantastic. <laughs> so why does the US become involved in World War I? There were a lot of people in the US who were really not interested in a war that was happening all the way across the Atlantic because they um, did not see themselves inside this global system. So they did not, did not see how this sort of thing could really affect them. You also have a lot of people in the US with very recent German heritage. And so they're not particularly gung-ho about going over to Europe to fight Germans. Um, and so there's a combination of factors that keeps the US officially out of the war. However, unofficially, the US has very strong political and economic ties to the Western allies, uh, France and Great Britain. And so it is in the US's best economic and political interest to continue trade with the Western allies, including arms trade and things that, that they need for the war. Um, what started drawing the US into the war was German submarine warfare in the Atlantic. And so you get US civilian ships, trade ships, or passenger ships that are torpedoed and sunk by German Unterseeboots, or U-boats. Um, so they'd sneak up under the water, torpedo the ship, sink the ship, sometimes rescue survivors and take prisoners, usually just kind of let them float off into the horizon. Um, and that's what this painting is. This is a German U-boat and a freighter um, that, that was torpedoed and sinking. Um, and then what triggered the US involvement in the war is what's called the Zimmerman Telegram, uh, which was sent in early 1917 from Germany to Mexico saying, we really don't want the US to be involved in the war in Europe, either as a military force or economically as they have been supplying the Western allies. And so the German idea was Mexico attacks the US and reclaims its old area in the Southwest, what's now Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, that area. And that distracts the US from aiding the Western allies in Europe and then Germany prevails. Um, and they're okay with Mexico's, Mexico having this land over here because Germany's not particularly interested in America. Yeah, How William. That was where I was going next. Uh, so, <laughs> so the British intercepted this communication, decoded it, translated it, verified it, and gave it to the United States. And that was enough to convince Congress and most of Amer the American populace that Germany was a great enough threat to America and to American-style democracy uh, to be involved in the war. And so we get involved in something that is defined as total war. And this is our technical term for the day, total war. This is what historians talk about in, in classes. So a total war is a war in which every available weapon is used and that th and the nation's full financial resources are devoted. So everything in a nation is channeled toward the war effort, okay? And this is an interesting term because if you think about it, uh, the implication is that 
removes a lot of the separation that classically existed between the military and the civilian population. If everything is part of the war effort, everything is part of the military, and therefore everything is a legitimate target of warfare. And this is one of the few total wars that really exists in history, especially in modern history, certainly in US history. And you can do a simple comparison. A lot of us here are historically minded. We've done some reading. We've listened to some lectures. If you compare it to the kind of war in the American Revolution, uh, the Civil War, there was that's probably a lot closer to a total war, where a good deal of the country was geared toward the war. Spanish-American War kind of happened over there. You didn't see a, a, a huge draft. You didn't see uh, industry being altered by the government for the war effort. Uh, World War II, another great example of total war. Uh, Vietnam, again, you see a draft, but you don't see the entire uh, industry and agriculture and rationing geared toward the war effort. And Persian Gulf, again, something that happened way over there, very small sort of activity as far as wars are concerned. So I'd say World War I, World War II, and sort of the Civil War fall toward this category. Um, and it's, it's a different way of thinking about warfare. So number one, an element of total war is conscription or the draft, as it's as it's called. And when you think about the draft in World War I, you have to think about it in a very different attitude to what we might have about the draft today. Uh, because this was a very massive war. It required a selective service. Um, and you also have to think about the cultural mindset of the people who registered and were called up by the draft. Um, I'd say from Vietnam forward, we have a very different attitude toward being sel selected and being forced into military service. At, and I use the word forced because that's kind of how it's seen from Vietnam forward. If you go backward in time, it was just kind of expected. And it, it was something that you did willingly, partially out of patriotism or nationalism, but during a time of total war, it's out of absolute necessity because you are under attack whether you're in the military or not, so you might as well fight back. So that's the mindset at that time. And I wanted to get the, the Uncle Sam poster and the, the very famous James Montgomery flag poster from 1917. Des Plaines was home to Illinois Selective Service District Number 1. And so what that means is local prominent men were selected to head the board. They were to register all eligible young men for the draft, keep those records, issue their cards, call them up, and funnel them onto trains to be sent off for training. Um, the registrations were held on June 5th, 1917, all men 21 to 31. The following year, June 5th, 1918, all the men who had turned 21 in that intervening year, and then September 12th, 1918, all men who hadn't registered yet, 18 to 45. So they call a broader range of people for that. And on the right there, I know it's difficult to see, but this is the form that you filled out when you went for uh, registration and it has all kinds of fields. Uh, one that's very interesting is the field declaring whether you're a citizen or an alien and declaring the origin of your parents as well because it's important if you're putting people into the service to know where their loyalty lies, if it would indeed lie with the US or if you might be turned as an agent of the enemy especially when you consider recent German heritage in this area. Uh, also, the little triangle down in the bottom left corner was to be removed 
if the person was of African descent because the armed forces were segregated uh, actually until after World War II. And so uh, they would still be drafted, but they'd be placed in different units in different stacks uh, in the paperwork. This is a photograph of downtown Des Plaines on Ellenwood Street, right next to the train depot. These buildings are Minor Street off in the background, so we're facing north. This is an entrainment ceremony. So when your lottery number came up in the draft, you would be in a group of hundreds of other men to be sh uh, put on trains. And so what the village board did here in Des Plaines was put on these ceremonies. So we see some of our, our village board members up there speaking to a sea of young men who are about to get on a train, probably heading for Camp Grant south of Rockford for training. Um, also, the Des Plaines Women's Club would receive word that these men were going out and they would often have a dinner for the men the night before prepared by the women's club. And then they go off for training. So this is a photo of some area guys um, at Camp Grant south of Rockford. And this guy right here is the only one we have identified. He's pointing his rifle way off into the distance over there. Uh, that's Henry Chidley from Des Plaines, um, and it's his descendants that have gotten us this photograph. And if you're interested in the poster art for the title board back there, the silhouettes, this is the picture that I took and turned into the silhouette for the theme of the exhibit. And then they were to go off to Europe and fight in the war. And they faced some things that prior wars really didn't prepare our armed forces for. Um, there weren't necessarily any brand new ideas being executed out on the battlefield, but it's the degree to which all of these ideas were executed and implemented and the, <coughs> the amount of destruction that they brought was new, on a new scale at this time. So some of these things were the technology evident in machine guns, again, not new, but new models implemented on a great scale, aircraft, tanks, uh, poison gas. You hear about like mustard gas in World War I. Uh, there's actually phases where they brought in this gas and then that gas and then that gas, and it gets progressively worse. So the first gas is Zillow bromide, and that just causes irritation and tears. Um, phosgene gas, which causes suffocation. Chlorine gas, which also causes suffocation. And then we get the sulfur mustard gas, which causes burns and blisters on your skin, and if you breathe it in, in your lungs. So that's the gas that we're talking about. And in response for all these technologies, you had a defensive technology or a greater offensive technology. So here's our soldier with his gas mask on, his helmet to deflect some bullets if he was sticking his head above the trench. But interestingly, still standing next to a horse with a feed bag. So we have this combination of older technology and newer technology. And if you want to see a gas mask up close, there's one behind glass over in the exhibit here. Um, petroleum, again, not brand new at World War I, but implemented in new ways. So we get trucks and ambulances, tanks, ships running on petroleum instead of on coal steam, um, and aircraft again. Some of these things overlap. Uh, World War I was the first war where medics were embedded with the uh, battle forces. And so you start getting medical personnel in the field. You get med kits supplied to the troops during World War I. And that's vital in a war where you have such great destruction. And it's also just an innovation. Get people who are wounded 
as much treatment as you can immediately, then take them to an aid station and ultimately a hospital, evacuate them, but provide care along the way instead of, if you go back further, it's just kind of fields of people laying around wounded, not necessarily dead, and then after the battle has been decided, evacuate them off. So we do have a change in that strategy as well. So this is a difficult to see photograph as well, but this is a German battle trench. And if you look closely, you can see they're literally just laying on top of each other. But it's a necessary defense if you think you stick your head off, somebody's just going to take a machine gun and mow you down. And so this is your only form of protection out on the battlefield. And you can see there's a line of rifles. They just leave them up there on the edge of the trench. And then they hear somebody coming. They can pop up, and they're ready to uh, defend themselves. Um, but as you can imagine, these filled with water every time it rained. They filled with human waste. If you can't pop your head up to throw your waste over the edge. Um, they spread disease because of the damp condition, trench foot and trench mouth, the festering of wounds. Um, and also, they were very crowded conditions, so it's easy to tr tr transmit disease, uh, especially flu uh, during World War I. And we'll get to the 1918 flu pandemic toward the end. Frank Baranski of Des Plaines was in the Illinois National Guard, and they were initially trained in 1917 uh, to act as the Army's grave registration. So they would recover remains after a battle and then attempt to identify the remains and um, give them some sort of interment. And so often remains would be interred in cemeteries in France. Um, sometimes those would be removed and then sent back to the United States for internment at a family burial plot or national cemetery. And actually several of the, uh, the men from Des Plaines who died in the service were returned to Des Plaines uh, for, for burial. Um, I know of at least one who is still buried in France. These are the names of the seven men from Des Plaines who perished in the military during the war. Uh, George Cook, the third name, is in the photo here in his uh, doughboy uniform. Uh, Anton Biba is the one who is still buried in France. The term home front, which we're all fairly familiar with, was coined during World War I. And it was coined in Britain because if you think about total war, you have the battlefront, that's where the military is. Civilians are still involved in the war, but they're at home, so it's the home front. Um, so what's very important on the home front is production for the war effort, industrial and agricultural. And when you think about the United States involvement, so before the US was militarily involved, we kind of acted as a home front for the Western allies in a way because we were selling the necessary supplies to the allies. So we're getting it to them, um, but we were not involved militarily. And it was not you know, a total concerted government effort yet. Um, it was more just economics. Then when the US became involved in the war, you started getting rationing, you started getting the military taking the first cut of what they needed, that sort of rationalization of the market. Um, and also, this is another draft form. If you were working in uh, a necessary industry, if you were a farmer um, producing crops necessary for the war effort, or if you had certain family conditions, you could apply for an exemption from the selective service. And that's what this is. This is asking questions about your farm to see if you qualify for that exemption from the draft. War bonds was a way 
for the government to raise money. I'm sure we all are fairly familiar with how bonds work. You give, the, you give a loan, basically, to the federal government with the promise that after we succeed in the war and the economy's back to normal and we raise money with taxes, then we'll give you your money back with interest. Um, and so there were campaigns, there were local boards, there were posters, advertisements, all kinds of things to get people to buy war bonds because the government needed money badly. Um, the U.S. did not have a massive in military industrial complex to wield at the start of World War I. They had to build it up. And so down here at the bottom, we have a clipping of the uh, Des Plaines Women's Club uh, meeting minutes. And this is their resolution to buy a $50 Liberty bond. The Liberty Drive is what the, the bond issues were called. And what they decided was they pass it with an amendment that they buy two $50 Liberty bonds uh, as a group. And they did this several times uh, over the course of the war. And in the village board meeting minutes, you have the village government buying war bonds. And you see banks and other organizations buying war bonds and individuals buying war bonds. So everyone's getting involved financially in the success of this war. And then we get rationing. And during World War II, rationing was much more strict. During World War I, it was mostly voluntary. What would happen is the government would get what they needed and then the rest went into the general market. And so there were some shortages of foodstuffs and building materials and that sort of thing. And what the government was relying on was people choosing to consume less in the market so that there would be enough to stretch across the entire country. Um, and so we see an interesting emphasis on sugar. That surprised me. Sugar was a huge thing because they needed it, one, to maintain morale in the uh, Western European countries. Western Europe doesn't produce any sugar crops, and so they had to get it all from us. And so how do you make people happy? You give them some cake. I, d I, don't, I don't think Marie Antoinette had it all that wrong. Um, <laughs> And then at different times, depending on how the crops were turning out on a certain year, uh, depending on you know, the cattle herds, you know, they may or may not have a shortage of meat or of a grain or of butter. You know. And so what was the focus of these rationing efforts changed over the course of the war. And these newspaper columns, the one on the left, that's titled The Honor Ration. That comes from the Tribune. And it's just advice on, on how to cut down on your sugar consumption. And then on the right, what happened was the Des Plaines Women's Club, again, very involved in the war. We're talking about the home front. Women are still very much in charge of the homes. And so it's obvious that they'd be in charge of the home front as well. The Women's Club got a lecture on uh, food conservation and canning. And then what they did was they took that and went to the schools into the developing concept of home economics at the time and taught the children food conservation and canning. And so you see that this information might have started from some government agency, but it, it really does branch out through our natural social networks that we had at the time. It was also very important for the home front to provide aid and comfort for the troops. Um, and we did that through Red Cross, Salvation Army sorts of organization. The Red Cross provided medical services. The, the uh, military did not have an enormous section of it devoted to medicine. So the Red Cross had the field hospitals and all those sorts of things to save the lives over in Europe. Likewise, the Salvation Army would go and set up tents and huts and give the troops some rest and relaxation, some recreation. Uh, they'd have a band. They'd, what, what's the Salvation Army famous for? Donuts. donuts. They went and fried donuts. 
And Emma can tell you all about that. She's, she's our donut expert back there. So catch her afterward. And the women's club would raise money for the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, Veterans Homes, um, other organizations that were providing services, refugee causes, that sort of thing. Because like any war, especially a great war, it's going to displace large numbers of civilian populations. And so they were providing services for uh, even the Armenians in Syria who were being displaced by the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish Republic during the war. And so you see this global involvement of this little club here in Des Plaines. Um, and then for the returning veterans of these wars, we had the Veterans of Foreign Wars established here and one of the earliest posts of the American Legion, post number 36, established here in Des Plaines. It was also important to just keep in touch with the men that you knew who were in the military. And this is, this is a really important point for me because home is a very important concept. We've probably all been homesick. Uh, I don't know how many of us in this room have served in the military, uh, but when you're across the ocean um, in an era before jet air flight, you know, <laughs> It's a long way away, and you're doing something that you probably thought that you'd never have to do. You're killing other people. And so it's very important that we have a cause worth fighting for and that we remind why we remind our own military service members why they're fighting, because otherwise we are simply treating them as mechanisms in a war machine and that removes their humanity from them. And so that's why there's always efforts to keep the troops in touch with families or even strangers, just people from the same country who want to sit down and write a letter. And that's what we have here in World War I. On the left is a letter to Alfred Abbey, uh, who was at that time training at Camp Grant. It's from his mother who lived on uh, Thacker. Um, the second page of this letter actually mentions how they had made a service flag. So the service flag is the, the red border, white field, and blue star that you would hang in your window if you had somebody from your family in the service. They put this little uh, tricolor ribbon around the border of their service flag and sent him a little scrap to say, hold on to this, we remember you, remember us, and come back. And then on the right, this is a custom picture postcard from France. So uh, the man there is Leo Brunner, and he sent this back to his classmate in Des Plaines, Jeanette Jefferson. Um, and so this was a very popular thing to do. Personalized picture postcards, very popular. Early 20th century thing to do, especially popular when you're away from home. You don't get to see each other. You can't Skype. You can't FaceTime. You can't pick up a phone and call, but you can, send, you can send a postcard with your own face on it. And even at Maine Township High School, the students were marching in the field for physical education. So uh, they didn't know how long the war would last. They figured that maybe this graduating class would be called up into service. And also, it's just a good thing to keep people aware of military protocol, keep them interested in the war effort. So the boys and the girls marched on the field. Uh, and in fact, um, Alfred Abbey from the previous slide, his sister Savina Abbey wrote in her diary, uh, joking about maybe the girls of Maine Township will march on Berlin next year. <laughs> So here they are standing um, at attention in the field. They even assigned officers and all sorts of things. Um, and a majority of the boys who graduated from Maine Township High School in 1919, their senior photograph um, in the yearbook is in uniform, most of them. All right, and I want to get to our local German roots. This photo is of the German Benevolent Society set up here in Des Plaines. Uh, that was an organization set up in the late 19th century to help 
people immigrating from Germany uh, get their households set up, uh, learn the English language, uh, acclimate them to American culture, and uh, provide them with some connection to their German ancestry as well. So that's them marching in the 4th of July parade in 1907. Um, and this is the sort of thing that just kind of faded away during World War I because it wasn't very popular to be associated with the Germany that we were at war with. And so you get a lot of people changing their very German sounding name, or at least changing the spelling of their German name, uh, giving up some of their German cultural traditions to become more Americanized. And a question that I had going into this was, how many of these guys had to register for the draft? Well, they were American citizens. Almost all of them were American citizens. So if they were men of a certain age, they had to register just like anyone else, no matter what your heritage is. And so I thought, well, what were their you know, thoughts? What were their convictions at that time? And that goes back to what I discussed more generally about the draft at the time was, you know, you chose your country or you were born into your country. And when your government said, go fight, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you just answered that call. Um, and you see that again somewhat in World War II, where people of recent German ancestry answered the call as well to fight against you know, their ancestral country. Um, there was a Chicago Tribune article I turned up where a man who had recently immigrated and naturalized uh, from Germany to the US jumped off a bridge after he was uh, drafted rather than fight his home country. Um, he did not die, he was disabled, but it was his way of avoiding going and fighting his, his uh, countrymen as he saw it. So the German Benevolent Society in Des Plaines closed in 1919 for apparent reasons. Um, also, after World War I, German immigration never really picked up again, and so it wasn't necessary for this kind of group to stick around. And then there was the flu pandemic. And in some ways, this is an even bigger story than the war, because this touched absolutely everywhere on the globe. Um, it was caused, they, scientists have determined, and there's still a lot of theories about the spread of the flu and everything, but we know that it was an H1N1 flu virus, which if you remember the swine flu in, in 2009, it was the same or a similar virus that got into the human population, um, spread very rapidly, um, it was known as the Spanish flu, not because it came from Spain or because it was more prevalent in Spain, but it seemed more prevalent in Spain because if you have a total war going on, you don't want to alarm your population too much with a domestic problem. And so news of the flu pandemic was somewhat censored in the US, the Western Allies, and the Central Powers. Everyone involved in the war kind of downplayed the flu. They took some public health measures against the flu, but uh, they kind of downplayed the news. Spain was neutral in the war, and so there was all kinds of reporting on the flu in Spain. So people <laughs> called it the Spanish flu because it seemed to be hitting Spain harder. But in reality, it affected the whole globe. 500 million people estimated out of a global population of 1.7 billion were infected and nearly 100 million died from the flu. And it was very strange how the flu killed people. It actually killed young adults as opposed to what we normally hear about the flu killing infants and the elderly. And so that's why this flu is very uh, unique, is the kind of people it killed. And there's various theories on why it killed young adults. 
Um, one is the, the war. So you have a lot of young people involved in industry, in global trade, in the military itself. And so they're more likely to be exposed to the flu. Um, especially if they're in the military, they probably are not getting the, the best nutrition out in the battlefield and that sort of thing. And so they're personally weakened on the home front. If there's some food shortages or rationing, you're also not getting enough nutrition and you're in a weakened state. So there's a lot of factors that could have contributed to it, but it's one of those things that will never be scientifically sure exactly why this pandemic was so bad. Um, to compare that 100 million dead to the war, the low end estimate of the war dead civilian and military combined was 15 million, uh, upper end around 20 million. So the flu definitely killed far more people than the war. And it got so bad from time to time, this is, uh, part of a column from the Des Plaines Suburban Times in 1918, and they would just pu publish an entire column of people killed by the flu. Here in Des Plaines, we do have records from the Maine Township Board of Health, uh, and these are the statistics, and you have to think, 1918, in October, 65 people, 65 cases of the flu in Maine Township. That doesn't sound like a lot to us, but you have to remember the population here was counted in the hundreds, not in the tens of thousands. And so these, these numbers are very significant. Um, it's estimated that 28% of the American population contracted the flu at that time. And in comparison, we don't have earlier years, but the next flu season, the entire flu season, only 14 cases. So a few hundred in 1918 to 1919, only 14, 1919 to 1920. And it got bad enough that the same Board of Health closed a theater in town, just said, until winter is over, no more theater. We can't have people in crowded places. Village Board canceled meetings. The Women's Club canceled meetings. Um, Riverview School down on Everett canceled school for all of October just because they didn't want the students to get sick or to spread the flu among the population. And returning to the seven men fr from Des Plaines who died, five of them, five out of seven men from Des Plaines who died in the service died of the flu. So those are the statistics we're talking about when we talk about World War I and the flu pandemic. And so enjoy the exhibit. It will be up through the end of 2019, so bring a friend some other time. Thank you.